Father, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to do church the way the village does it, kind of honest and raw and a little ADD and um, a little bit always hampered by technology. Um, and Father, I want to acknowledge that you are king and that you love us so dearly and that you are willing to deal with our weaknesses and deal with the things that scare us and be present with us. So Father, as I talk, um, just ask that you would be with all of us as we try to process what you're saying to us. Um, that you would give us courage to believe what is true and to push aside what is false, that you would give us courage to um, to be honest with ourselves, to face reality. Um, and I ask that in your holy name. Amen. So I want to talk today about the goodness of God, or just for a little moment do I want to talk about the goodness of God. Um, and the goodness of God is this, this really big term. So, and I could spend more than, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven, uh, all year talking about the goodness of God, or at least seven sermons talking about the goodness of God. Um, and, and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go start with Augustine and Aquinas. I'm not going to talk about how they've influenced Calvin and Luther and how that influenced you and what you believe about the goodness of God. I just want to talk about the word goodness connected to God. Because the thing that I have found over and over again as I deal with people and with myself is that I keep becoming confronted, I'm confronted with this word, God is good. And the, my problem, that usually when I'm trying to wrestle with issues in my own life or, or issues in other people's lives, when, when we're, we come up against things that are adverse, we begin to question if God is good. In fact, you know, on one end, we begin to say, well, all this suffering is here. So how can, how can a God, a good God allow all of this suffering? And so we're either caught up in that, or if we've decided to, we figured out how to navigate our, our way through that. And now we're followers of Jesus. A lot of times we kind of think that as soon as we start following Jesus, we're living in like a bubble wrap that like somehow if we follow Jesus, nothing bad will ever happen to us. That, that people won't die. At, at unfortunate times, that our car won't break down, that the, the entire sound system will just always work perfectly with great streaming video, and uh, my face will look great on camera instead of horrible. You know, I was watching Kevin O'Leary, for those of you who watch Shark Tank, and he was explaining how you have to do your makeup to look good in front of the camera, uh, which I will never do, I promise you. So, so like these are, these are things that I think will never happen to me if I am a follower of Jesus. And then I'm rudely awakened to this, this, what seems to be a frustrating contradiction that, that God is good and yet there is all this brokenness and adversity. I'm not going to solve that particular problem for you today. What I'm going to tell you is that in scripture, the goodness of God is expressed in his love. You can flip the slide, Ashton. And you can put these all slides up big. The goodness of God is expressed in his love. In 1 John 3.16, the writer John says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The, the expression of God's goodness, whatever it is, is expressed in his love, but its love is shown to us in the cross, in his death. And on the cross, there's this moment when Jesus says at the height of his suffering about the Roman soldiers and all of us, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. At, at the height of suffering for us, Jesus pleads for forgiveness for them and for us. God's goodness 
is expressed in his love, which is shown to us through his suffering for us. Now, Mark last week asked us this profound question. He asked us at the beginning of the sermon, where are you going? Where are you going? And I don't know if Mark really actually knew how profound of a question he was asking when he asked, but I have been pondering this, and it is a question that at every second and every minute of your life, you are invited to answer. Where are you going? Where are you going? Now, Mark talked about where he was going in, in talking about grocery stores and, and different things like that. And then he connected that to Paul, and we will too. But the, the, the question is already answered for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, where you are going is told to you and it is the answer all the time, no matter what you are doing in your life. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus appears to his apostles in Matthew 28, verse 18 and following. And this is the interaction. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what he's about to say, he's saying, I'm giving from a position of authority, ultimate authority. That's why I know that this is the answer to where are you going all the time because it's the ultimate authority that tells us the answer to the question of where you're going. It says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the answer to your question of where are you going is I am going to make disciples wherever Jesus is making disciples. That is the answer when I go to the grocery store. That is the answer when I sit down with my father. That is the answer when I sit across from my kids. That is the answer when I walk past my neighbors. That is the answer when I am pondering the people that I work with. And that is the answer that I wrestle with when I think about society itself. My call, where I am to go, is to make disciples, which means baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching. You guys are really distracting me. On is everything okay? Oh, okay. You switched my slides. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I have a small little audience who's working with my uh, iPad and I get, and it's super distracting. So <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, only because I'm always worried that everything is not going the way it's supposed to go, which this sermon probably speaks to. Anyway, we'll get back on track here. Wherever I go, I'm called to make disciples. Now, now this, this is an interesting thing because that means that when you are gardening, the question is, how am I making disciples doing this? When you're reading a book, how am I making disciples? When you're watching Netflix, how am I making disciples by doing this? When you are going and talking to your neighbor, how am I discipling? When you sit down across from your wife, how are you making a disciple? When you are engaging with your kids, how am I making a disciple? This is all that you are to be about. And here's the roadblock, and you can switch the slide. Here's the roadblock. the goodness of God. Because when I think about stepping into the life of my neighbor, or I think about stepping into the life of my wife or my kids in ways that is bringing about discipleship and teaching and learning in the way of Jesus, I begin to doubt the goodness of God. Because here's the thing. Yes, the goodness of God is expressed by the love of God. And the love of God is expressed by the suffering of God. And if I choose to step in and follow Jesus, I have these fears, as you can see in the bottom of my little chart, that things are, I'm going to end up doing things I don't want to do in relationship to my kids, my wife, my family, my world. I, I'm going to probably fail. I There may be danger. And I'm not so sure that God's goodness is going to keep me from having to experience those. And I'd rather not experience those. I'd rather be safe and comfortable, easy and avoidant. 
Right? Because these things I at least know how to control. I know how to deal with these. And God's goodness is actually difficult to define. It's difficult to grab hold of. It's only something I can experience and have to trust and have to step into. You can actually put the thing back to me now. (laughs) We're in this series on Eastertide. And in fact, next week is the end of our series of Eastertide because next week is Pentecost. And Pentecost is the celebration of the Spirit of God being poured out on the disciples at the beginning of Acts and the Spirit of God being given to all who are willing to repent and believe in Jesus. And so we're celebrating that. And it's this time between Easter and Pentecost. And we look at Acts to see how things, how the Holy Spirit works, what he does, where he's going, and how we might involve ourselves in what God is doing. And so we begin to talk about ourselves as superheroes because the Spirit of God, heaven, and earth meeting in us gives us superpowers. And so we've instead of being the Justice League, we're the Easter League, and we our superpowers are repentance and forgiveness and obedience. And these are the elements that we hold on to as we as we express and bring the gospel to bear in 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 our the lives of the people around us. So if you want to know what it looks like to disciple someone, it's to bring repentance, obedience, and forgiveness into their world. Um, but we really, I think, when we, if we're going to say we're the, the Easter League, we have to reflect a little bit on what it means to be a superhero. Because I, I love superhero movies, and, and really I root for DC movies to be good, which they aren't. Um, but I grew up with the Justice League, and... And some of them are, but I grew up with the Justice League as a kid. And, and I love those heroes and I love them getting together to fight. But here's the thing about Marvel or DC superheroes. By themselves individually, they're actually capable of beating the minions of the evil person. They can usually do it on their own or with one other sidekick, right? They're capable of doing that. They have superpowers. But even if they are equal to the villain themselves, they're going to need help to defeat them. And and it's really interesting that in almost every movie you see in these superheroes some form of existential angst where they have to figure out, like, do I want to do this? Do I want to use my power to go face someone with an equal power? And why would I do that? Right? And and there's this this, this question. And here's, but I would argue that that's where you and I are. Some of us are leaping off the cliff, holding desperately to God's goodness and moving forward and try and hoping that the gospel will explode all around us. And others of us are at the Easter League Hall, twiddling our thumbs still in our avoidant, safe, comfortable spaces, not sure we want to actually call on our superpowers because it may require a certain element of suffering. And it also may not be our agenda. We have to submit to a different one. The struggle we have to bring the gospel to bear in people's lives, to answering the question, where are you going, is that we struggle to believe God is good. I want to show you what happens when you believe God is good and you jump off the cliff. And to do that, we're just going to process all of Acts chapter 16 or most of it. Now, I had Mark read the whole thing, and I would suggest that you get your app or your Bible and you open up to Acts 16, because I'm not going to read any of it. I'm actually just going to talk through it. See, because the chapter, starting in verse 6, begins with Paul not actually knowing where he's supposed to go. He just knows that he's supposed to go, and he knows that he needs to bring the gospel. And so what is he doing? He's going, and he's going. And what it says is that the Holy Spirit won't let him go. Now, how do we interpret that the Holy Spirit won't let him go? We don't know. It could have been that Luke came down with the coronavirus, and they had to isolate for 14 days, and so they couldn't go there. Or it simply could be that that it was the weather was too dangerous, that the there wasn't a way for them to go where they wanted to go. But they kept trying to go because they fully believed that they were to be moving towards 
these spaces and bringing the gospel and risking it. So Paul has a vision. And Mark said last week, you know, a lot of us want visions, but until we find out what comes with visions, right? And if we, and he didn't actually give us a clue as to actually what comes with this vision. Um, he, cause he got to talk about Lydia and Lydia is a nice, beautiful, soft, wonderful moment of trusting God. Right. But they have a vision and I love it. They have the vision or Paul has a vision. His buddy Silas and Luke and whoever else is with him. They like, they're like, all right, let's go. This is it. We now know where to go. We're going to Macedonia. You know, it's funny. A man is in the vision, but we never find out about the man. Right. We don't know if they actually talk to the man or not. But the first person that they encounter in Philippi that we get to know about is Lydia. Now, what's interesting about Lydia is in, in Philippi, there's no synagogue. So any kind of God fear is out by the, the river, basically doing a, what we would call a proto synagogue. They're, they're reading scripture and they're praying together. So Paul would have come up to them and you know, it seems like it happens really fast, but I guarantee you, Paul didn't just come in there and go like, Hey man, like, let me tell you about Jesus. Everybody's like, Oh Jesus, that makes sense. Like if you actually begin to look at what the words actually mean in describing the conversation there, you find out that this is a rational movement into the kingdom of God. Paul came and he said, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, oh, we're talking about the Old Testament. He's like, well, what do you know? And they're like, well, Abraham and Moses and the prophets and the promised Messiah. They would have given the overview. And he would have said, yes, and Jesus. And let me tell you about Jesus because you've been working so hard to get it right. And you know that this is the right thing to do. Let me just flip it upside down and tell you that Jesus took care of the sacrifice, that Jesus followed the law perfectly, and now you have an opportunity to have a relationship, an intimate one-on-one relationship with the God of the universe. And for Lydia, and probably for all those people around her, that ship was really gentle, as Mark said. It's an easy movement. She's a spiritual seeker. She didn't need any great apologetic, any great, you know, defense of the faith. She just needed to be introduced to Jesus, and she gently moves into the kingdom of God. Now, you, if this was your thing, if you're like, wow, we trusted God, we got to Philippi, and and so you can just see Luke and Paul and Timothy uh, and Silas are sitting around drinking their coffee in the evening. You know, they, they say goodnight to Lydia, and they're drinking their coffee, and they're like, this is great. Like we, all these people are now following Jesus. Lydia, she's, she's wealthy. She's passionate. She's well known. Like she has connections. This church is going to explode. God is blessing what we did. God is good. I love how we always say God is good when things are going well, right? That's how it works. God is good. Well, isn't his sacrifice on the cross so amazing? Here's the thing that we're all really actually afraid of is that any time you leap off the cliff and begin to experience the goodness of God, there is a a spiritual slapback. Now, think about this. Paul had a plan. Anytime you plant a church, anytime you parent, anytime you offer goodness to your husband, anytime you want to pursue your neighbor, anytime you want to speak against oppression in the culture, anytime you want to deal with anything with a gospel way of thinking, you're going to get pushback. You know it. And you are afraid of what that might look like. Because actually, you and I, and fairly, are afraid of suffering. We don't want to suffer, and we don't like adverse things to happen to us. And and really, at some level, our idols are comfortability in our culture. We want to be comfortable. That's why this COVID thing is so frustrating and wonderful for some of us. Right? We're comfortable because we're enjoying our home and we're frustrated because we can't do what we want to do and people are telling us what to do. Right? We, we, we don't know what to do with all of that. But for Paul, I'm assuming he had a plan. And the enemy loves to mess up plans, especially when they have to do with pushing the darkness out with the light. So what happens? Well, the next couple of days they're headed off to prayer and this slave girl, okay? Now, we need to think about the slave girl. She is not just oppressed by demons. She's oppressed by men, 
right? She is a slave of men and demons. And she's very popular because in the first century, if you wanted to go on a trip, you went to the soothsayer to find out if the trip was going to be okay. You're going to get married. You're going to do a financial deal. Like everything had to go to the oracle. And she was a very popular oracle because she was possessed by craziness, by demons. And that gave her some knowledge of the future and some indication of what would happen. And so she had power and people went to her and she was making money for her slave masters. Okay. And the enemy is using her to destroy the plans of Paul because Paul has a strategy to reach Philippi and it's not to go around announcing himself at every door right away, right? He wants to do it strategically. So this woman, this young slave, starts following him around and screaming. Can you, what, those of you who have three-year-olds totally understand this. This is just your everyday experience in life, right? Um, but, or two-year-olds, I, I'm, I'm past that stage. I can't even remember. It's one to three. They're just, you know, Maybe even teenagers. Yeah, it kind of goes up and then hits the teenagers, and then they're screaming at you. Anyway, the, I digress. Um, but she's yelling that they are the servants of the Most High God. And she's yelling it, and she's yelling it. And you see, you can imagine this, and this is the part about Bible reading that we all need to kind of get into. You need to imagine this. It's dirty. It's sweaty. Paul's eating his falafel and he's wandering off to prayer with his buddies. And there is this woman screaming at the top of her lungs that they're the servants of the most high God. Now you can imagine they probably look at each other and be like, all right, maybe she'll just stop. Like if we just keep walking, like she'll stop. Right. But she doesn't. And it says that I think if I remember it, it says that she was great. uh, Paul was greatly annoyed, (laughs) which if you look at the word annoyed, it's just really this, ah, I'm frustrated with the situation. I don't like it. Now, I'm not, I, I actually was thinking about this. I'm like, I don't know if Paul was thinking ahead here. Maybe Paul was thinking ahead, but maybe Paul was not thinking ahead. And out of his annoyance, he brings the gospel to bear in power. And he casts out the demons Now, here's the thing. I just want you to think about something. When somebody is oppressed and you remove them from oppression, you don't do any good. Because that, yes, you might introduce that woman who, this young slave girl, is introduced to God violently and most likely taken in by followers of Jesus. But the social system with which she is enslaved still exists. And what it's interesting here is that out of Paul's annoyance, either on purpose or by just accident, Paul says, I am now going to act in the way of Jesus in the face of evil, and I am going to free you and step into slavery myself. This is why we don't believe in the goodness of God. It's because the goodness of God leads us into the freedom of others and the slavery or at least the suffering that they experience. Right, And so Paul steps in, and what happens to him? I, you have to contemplate this. It's, this is it's crazy. By casting out the demonic spirit, he's ruining the economy. <laughs> that is not good. So much so that they drag him and Silas out, and they beat them with rods, which means they're almost dead, probably in an inch of their life. Then they drag them into jail and put them in stocks. And when you put someone in stocks, it's not super uncomfortable. It's just a little bit uncomfortable. So you've been beaten and then your legs are spread apart and your arms are. And you have to sit there and guess where the stocks are in jail? Because these jails are kind of sloped. It's where all the waste lands. Okay. So there they are sitting in the waste, beaten an inch of their life. And it would be totally legitimate for them to question the vision that they had. Lydia was awesome. The slave girl, not so much. We're in stocks, right? We're in suffering. And and our attitude towards suffering is often to question if God is actually good. What's remarkable about this story is that's not what Paul or Silas question. In fact, their attitude towards suffering leads them to singing, and singing in such a powerful way that they get the entire jail to listen to them sing. 
Why is it that they are so passionate about singing? How can they possibly do this in the midst of suffering? Well, in Matthew, back to that passage in Matthew 28, they believe something that I don't think you and I often grab hold of and believe. And it's connected to the goodness of God. It says in verse 18 of Matthew 28, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. And then at the end, he says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So if you might imagine for a moment that there is Silas and there is Paul in the stocks, in the poop, in the crap, and they know that God of the universe, who is over the jailer, over Caesar, over the people who beat them, over the Jewish rulers, over all the rulers of the earth, right there, standing there, is in full authority, and they are the servants of God on the mission of God, meaning that in their suffering, something is about to happen. That they are called to demonstrate the power of God. And to demonstrate the power of God, they must act in the way of forgiveness. That is a superpower. You have to act in the way of forgiveness in your suffering. You have to act in the way of obedience. And really, you have to acknowledge that you'd rather be somewhere else than there. And so they begin to sing. And they are singing in a way to acknowledge that God is the ruler of this moment, not the jailer, not anyone else. Now, there is a third person. If Lydia was spiritually sensitive and the slave girl was spiritually oppressed, the jailer is your typical blue-collar worker, maybe upper-class blue-collar worker. He was a centurion. He's retired. He got a civil job. It's his, he's, he's got his retirement, and he's working a second job. He is loving life. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got a nice YouTube channel on the side, and he's got his jail job. And he, if, if he were to go over to Paul and Silas and sit down and be like, tell me what's going on. And they're like, okay, like, so, you know, Abraham, no, you don't know. Let's tell you about Abraham and Moses and the prophets and how they, pro, you know, kind of pointed towards Jesus. Now, Jesus was this guy who lived in the backwater of Jerusalem. You know where, where that is, Israel, those, those people? Oh, yeah. The, nobody really ever goes there. Um, yeah, he died on the cross. The Romans killed him. And it turns out that he was God and he rose from the dead. The jailer would be like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I can see where that's gotten you. And I don't really care. I mean, I don't need this guy, right? I don't need it. So if Lydia needed someone to simply come and offer her Jesus and explain, and if, if the slave girl needed them to just violently basically push back the enemy, then the jailer needs... God, to, the gospel to be demonstrated. God's goodness to be demonstrated to him. So they're singing. And then all of a sudden, conveniently, an earthquake happens. And all the jail doors fly open. And typically, if you're a guy in jail, maybe not in stocks, but in jail, you're taking off. Like, this is your moment. Everybody's dealing with the earthquake. All right? But no, everybody stays in. I don't know how Paul and Silas... They must have had the most beautiful two-part uh, harmony. It's probably, sh we had somebody at the door. So uh, anyway, Mark will, will take care of the door. Anyway, so they must have had the most beautiful two-part harmony. And that kept those people there. You might want to go around and the. I'm going to pause everybody for a second. You're, you got live service. If you go around to the white door and just have a chat with them. Yeah. Anyway, we're back. It's good to see all of you. So the power of God had to be demonstrated. So what happens? The jailer wants to kill himself. The reason he wants to kill himself is his job is as long as he keeps everybody in jail, He's safe. His job is good. If one prisoner escapes, then his he dies. And it's a public execution. So why he wants to kill himself is he just doesn't want to have his family endure the humiliation 
of him being publicly hung. And so he's going to kill himself. But somehow Paul and Silas sense this. They're like, don't do it. Everything's going to be okay. Nobody's escaped. And he comes and he says, trembling, what do I need to do to be saved? The question that I asked at the beginning that Mark asks is, where are you going? Where are you going? Are you, are you called to Lydia? Are you called to the slave girl? Are you called to the um, jailer? Uh, is your husband the jailer? Is your husband Lydia? Is your husband the slave girl? I mean, literally, your, your kids, your neighbors, the places you go. There are people that God is inviting you to disciple. And each one of these people express a way that you can step in and offer the gospel. And so you have to ask yourself, where am I going? Who is God inviting me to disciple? And do I trust that the goodness of God will prevail in each one of these people's lives if I'm willing to bring the gospel to bear? Am I willing to live with the amount of intention that Paul does about going? Now, let me tell you why you need to believe in the goodness of God and act on the goodness of God and take seriously his loving action on the cross that communicates his goodness because of the rest of this story. Certainly there's some interesting dialogue and weirdness that goes on about the way Paul wants to make sure everybody knows he's a Roman soldier or not a soldier, citizen. And, but because he wants to be released without any kind of problem when he leaves. But it says that he ended up with Silas and Timothy and everyone else, I suspect, in Lydia's house. <clears throat> now here's the miracle. Jewish men, and then rabbis in particular, prayed this prayer. And every time I talk about this or think about it, it makes me cry when I look at this thing. It's hard for me not to. A Jewish man's prayer is in the morning is, Dear God, <clears throat> thank you for not making me a woman, Lydia, for not making me a slave, the slave girl, not making me a Gentile, the jailer. Now, do not think that Paul got, you know, blasted with lightning and he was persecuting the church and then he met Jesus and everything that was ever part of his culture was just stripped out of his uncomfortability and he was like just Jesus floating around. Paul had to struggle. If that was his prayer every day, can you imagine how miraculous this is as he is sitting in the new church with the, Jew, with the jailer's household, with Lydia's household, and with the slave girl and all the people who probably came when they saw this miraculous thing happen into the church? You're talking like 40, 50 people sitting in Lydia's, probably in her middle porch, and Paul has to have just been having his brain blown out because before he found Jesus, he would not want to associate with any of these people. And what's also fascinating to me about Christianity is that, and, and this moment in Philippi that just demonstrates it, it's Lydia is probably a dark woman, either an Indian woman or an Asian woman. We don't know what the, the, the slave girl is in her nationality. And we, you know, the Roman soldier is, is he's a Gentile, most likely he's Roman or Greek, some form, right? And so these, these are all different nationalities. It's so interesting to me that the gospel just cannot be contained by an ethnicity. And yet, when you look at all of the other faiths in this world, they all are all, they're all ethnocentric. And there's a reason for that. The gospel does not want to be contained by this little group of Jewish people. God's message of salvation and relationship does not want to be contained. That That's mind-blowing, and I hope that it, it at least encourages you to take hold of the goodness of God because something will happen if you actually know where you're going. If you know that all that you do comes under the idea that God has sent you to make disciples. And that would be your children, that would be your brother, that would be your father and mother, that would be your wife and husband, that would be your neighbor, that would be the people you work with. And in a philosophical sense, that would be the environments and um, social structures and political structures in which you interact with. You are called to bring the way of the gospel 
but you have to step out and take a risk because bringing the gospel is risky. Now, what's beautiful about how uh, Paul brought the gospel, and I'll just kind of end it here, is that number one, when he goes to Lydia, it's a very personal gospel. He's basically telling her, you can have a personal relationship with God. You can have an intimate relationship with God. It's not about your behaviors anymore. It's not about getting it right. It's about intimacy with God and grace. When it comes to the, the, the slave girl, it's freedom. You are no longer a slave, and followers of Jesus will stand up against your oppression. They will be oppressed for you. The gospel is now not just to this girl, but also to a society that is taking advantage of people. And last, what's really cool to me is that the last part is that really all Paul and Silas are doing in singing are they're telling the jailer, you're not in charge. The Roman, the Roman institution is not in charge. We're announcing who's king, and that's Jesus. And so the king comes to bear on all things. And that's what the gospel is. And you have to say, where am I going and how am I bringing these things to bear in the people around me? I'm looking forward to next week and talking about the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for your spirit and I and for your goodness and for the love that you have poured out on us. Give us the courage to leap and to hold on tightly and to know that the things that you have laid us laid out for us to do are good and that you haven't abandoned us and you're not trying to catch up with us, that you're already working and inviting us to be part of that. So I ask that you would bless us in your holy name. Amen.